it's really not common to be harvesting a bunch of vegetables in December, but here in Florida where I live, this is the ideal time to be growing in the garden. And so we have a ton of things that we can harvest. So come along, let's figure out what all we can get from the garden today. So our first item of the day is gonna be one that's probably pretty surprising and that is summer squash. <laughs> This beast right here is my Tromachino squash, which has done spectacular. I can't even stop talking about it. That's how amazing it has done. It did stop producing female flowers for a few weeks there, but then all of a sudden we got a big rain. And then on top of that, I had trimmed off all of the fruit except for this big one back here. I'll show you in just a second. I want that one to reach a winter squash. So I need it to stay on the vine for as long as possible. I wanted to give the plant all the opportunity to be able to get that winter squash to completely ripen before we hit our first frost date, which actually should have already happened. <laughs> so we're overdue. I took off all of the other fruit that was on here and I'm continuing to do that. And so we're gonna pull one off today or I think a couple off today, um, to make sure that we let this plant have all the time it needs to ripen that one super large one. Cause I really do want to taste this squash as a winter squash. The summer squash is so sweet. It is so good, <laughs> but I'm not sure what the winter squash is. It's the first time I've ever grown it and it grows both. You can do one or the other. It just depends on how long you want to leave it on the vine. So I have to kind of come through this wildness here. There we go. Now you can let them, <laughs> you can definitely let them get a lot bigger. I've let them get up to three feet tall, but once again, we're trying to make sure that this big guy right here ripens to completion. It's already starting to orange up. So I want to get all of the ones off the plant that are immature. So that it gives all the energy to the plant to finish this one. This is just one plant. <laughs> The next one on the list is going to be tomatoes. Once again, another surprising one for December, but down here, our temperatures during the day are somewhere around 70 and 80 degrees, which is great for tomatoes. They love warm weather. At nights, it drops down. We have been having these incredible swings. It's actually pretty crazy. Like it'll get down to 40 degrees at night and then up to 80 during the day. So they've been swinging wildly back and forth. I'm shocked that the plants in the garden are doing as well as they are because of this. But it has brought down that daytime temperature quite a bit for down here. So I'm super happy because these tomatoes are doing amazing. Now I also have some tomatoes in containers. I don't know if you guys remember this from when I abandoned my garden to go on my cross country trip, but these potted tomato plants were not doing well. <laughs> they were not okay. They had not gotten enough water from the Blomots. I mean, they got enough to keep them alive, but it did stunt their growth considerably, but check them out now. They look incredible. Incredible. They have all bushed out and gotten really big and even the kind of lanky ones um, that kind of got tall and just had the leaves on the top have started to fill out and we're getting tomatoes from those as well. Now I normally don't allow my tomatoes to get this ripened on the vine. If you've lived in Florida any length of time, you know that every bug, pest, and animal is going to try to come for them, even during the cold months. So I harvest mine as early as possible, even before they start to change colors, right as they start to turn from that light green, like this one, for example, that light green to that like whitish color. And then you start to see a little bit of blush. That's plenty of time. They'll finish it ripening inside.
right next door to the tomatoes, we had the multiplier green onions. I'm not 100% sure of the type of green onion that they are, but they are a perennial multiplying, which means that they split apart into multiples. I'm going to show you what they look like. I'm not 100% how to harvest these because they are bunched together. So I think that you pull the whole thing out of the ground, you break the pieces off that you want, and then you replant it. I think. <laughs> Let's see. We're just going to do it to one of them today just to see if that works or if I kill it. And if I kill it, at least I have other plants here and I don't destroy them all. <laughs> This is what I mean by multiplier onion. <laughs> Look what has happened to these onions. They have split apart and created more than one plant. These did have, I believe, two when I first put them in the ground. But now they have, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to break off. I think I'm going to break off. Let's just try trimming off the bottom. Now, if you wanted to, you could totally just take, just take the greens off the top, but I really want the whites. So here's one. I think we just kind of pull them apart. There's two. Ooh. Okay. All right. Oh, it looks like looks like a bunch of them separated. These two are still together, so I'm going to rebury these. Now, I don't believe that that works with regular green onions. You'll probably kill regular green onions, but you can cut the regular green onions all the way down to the bottom as long as you don't cut the roots off and they will grow new tops. But these are multiplier or perennial onions and so they're gonna grow whole new shoots like you see here. They're gonna grow new plants right off of them. If I did that correctly, <laughs> we will continue to grow green onions from this plant and we'll just have an endless supply of green onions. I'll never have to plant them again. I love perennial vegetables. Here's one we don't want to miss. This little guy right here is a volunteer that pops up all over my garden. This is a ground cherry. Ground cherries are in the tomatillo family, but they're super, super tiny. This is a ground cherry and it has a little husk, just like a tomatillo, and that is the part that you eat. Mm. Such a strange flavor. No, no. These girls like to steal my tomatillos all the time. So the way that you know if they're ready, believe it or not, is you kind of shake them and then you'll have them fall to the ground and their husks are going to be kind of papery and white. Once they've fallen from the plant, that means that they're fully ripe and ready. So really harvesting these guys is just as simple as walk, looking around on the ground for where they've fallen off and just picking them up. <laughs> it's like the easiest way to know when a plant is ripe. So if you've never grown these before, they kind of taste like some sort of tropical fruit mixed with a tomato or a tomatillo. I guess more of a tomatillo if you've eaten those because they're sweeter than a tomato. These are sweeter, especially with the pineapple tomatillo. No Chloe. They love them. <laughs> what I like to do with them is I like to put them in a tomatillo 
salsa. So a sweet salsa is usually what I make with them. It's really good. Now you'll see there's a bunch of them down here that I'm not picking up. They're smaller. The smaller ones aren't quite as, you know, sweet or ripe as the bigger ones are. <laughs> Let me show you the difference in size because it's really hard to tell small from large. <laughs> no, Chloe. <laughs> she loves them. That's the difference between small and large. So I'm going to leave the small ones in the bed and they're going to come back next year and grow me more, more tomatillo plants. I could pick them up and put them in different parts of the bed. So they're not always coming back in these four beds because that's usually what happened, but maybe I'll do that later. Right across the way, we have our brassica bed. And so this is where I've been pulling out a bunch of broccolis. And I have gotten, I think, six heads so far of the main head of the plant. Uh, but now we have some side shoots. I'm going to show you what those look like. Besides the broccoli, we have our first cauliflowers coming in. They're not quite ready yet. So we're not gonna pull them right now, but aren't they so cute? We have the white and then we have the purple. It's the first time I've ever grown the purple. It's a much taller plant than I'm used to. This is what I'm used to. <laughs> this is much bigger, but I'm hoping that means that we're gonna have some really big purple cauliflower heads. So this is the first one that I ever harvested. And you can see that now these are all the little side shoots that are coming in. They're actually not quite ready yet, so we're not going to harvest these. We already got the main heads. The main heads were right here. And so now what you have happening are these little side shoots that come out from all over the plant. And those will produce those little florets. This is another brassica bed. Well, it's kind of a mix. It has the prism kale, which I am in love with <laughs> this stuff is that curly texture that I really like, but it's not that spicy, bitter tasting that some of the other curly kales have. I'm, at, I'm in love with this one. I'm gonna keep the seeds. I'm gonna let this grow out and save the seeds from it. But for now, we're just gonna take some of the leaves. So we're using the cut and come again method where we take off the bottom leaves and let the center continue to grow. Just because of my OCD, I don't want to leave this one looking different. <laughs> so I don't want to leave it off balance. <laughs> so that's all you really need to leave. So let's clear this other one. Oh, wow. So we definitely have to get this harvested. This is way out of control. So we have, I think that is a broccoli. This is a red mustard. This is Chaijimi Sai. And that is Tokyo Beckinaw. And it's kind of getting wild right here. So we're going to take a bunch of it off. Harvesting it not only gives you greens to eat, but it also helps control the plant growth. It'll slow it down and it'll keep it, hopefully, from bolting, especially with these wild swings and temperatures that we've been getting.
think we're gonna need a bigger basket. <laughs> That's definitely quite a few salads. So I got a new bowl because we had run out of room in our harvest basket. So the next thing we're gonna harvest is herbs. Uh, my sister put in a request that she wants more basil, Genevieve basil, which this I believe is a type. It is actually lemon basil that one of the friends of the channel sent me. And so I grew it and it grows amazing and it's really hardy. It doesn't bolt super fast, which is nice. I'm going to take off all of this basil. I know that seems kind of extreme, but I am going to take off all of it. It doesn't have long to live with a frost coming soon. So I'm going to get it all out and I'm going to process it in different ways. I'm going to dehydrate some for my sister and then I'm also going to freeze dry some. Now this plant might actually still bounce back after I do this, uh, but like I said, it won't last long. Look at that, <laughs> already a whole bowl. All right, my sister also asked for oregano, so we're gonna go ahead and get her some of that too. We're also gonna take a bunch of this parsley, cut it back. And then for me, I want a bunch of this lemon balm for some teas that I'm making. So I'm pretty much gonna take all of it. And then I do have some mint down here that tried growing back after I cut it back and I'm gonna take that too for my tea. That's going to be the basis of my tea that I'm making. So the part with the most in it, it's going to be mint and lemon balm. And then I have some dried berries that I'm going to add to it and some chamomile flowers. I think I have some echinacea flowers, a bunch of stuff in my medicinal area. I'll even put some of that parsley in there. I bet you that'd be great. Now this guy right here is strawberries and they should be ready to harvest right now. But uh, I did start these a little late. I was just, I guess dragging my feet. I don't know. <laughs> I should have started them about a month earlier and I didn't, but I'm already getting flowers and not only flowers. I have fruit as well. So I am not long at all to having a lot of strawberries to harvest out of the garden. So probably maybe another week or two and I should have these guys at least. And then all of these other ones are already starting to produce their flower buds. See that right there? That's going to be a flower. There's a couple right, if I can get that right there right there we have some right here that have already fruited some more flowers some more fruit it should be this whole area is going to have strawberries in just a matter of a couple of weeks the garden is definitely in full-blown harvest mode it is abundant more than i could ask for and that is what winter or fall fall and winter are all about here in florida is these kinds of results because we can grow warm we can grow cold. We can grow all the traditional stuff. Well, most of it <laughs> right now. And so we are, but now we got to get all this stuff inside get it clean, get it packaged. And I'm going to show you what I'm doing with those tomatoes. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to make our own sun dried tomatoes. And we also have to harvest a bunch of lettuce from the arrow garden. I have lettuce out in the garden. It's growing great, but it's a little small because once again, I started my season a little bit late. It should already have come in, but uh, we do have our arrow garden lettuce, which is ready to harvest. When I'm harvesting lettuce from the arrow garden, I always do that cut and come again method, kind of like what we did for the mustard greens and the Chinese cabbage earlier. I cut the outer leaves first. Now, these plants are still quite immature. They're not very big, but they are 
perfectly good for the cut and come again method. They had probably six or seven or eight leaves on each one of the plants. So I really just left about three or four leaves in the center so that the plants can continue growing. It doesn't hurt the plants at all. Then my method of storing these greens and all greens really is to run them under cold water, let them soak for maybe 10 minutes, and then I put them through my salad spinner to get all the liquid off of them that I possibly can. The cold water really helps to make sure that there is no bitterness left in the lettuce. This was grown inside, so that's not really as much of a concern, but if you're growing your lettuce outside, um, putting it in cold water can help bring down any kind of bitterness that it might have uh, gotten from you know the heat of our days. Also putting it in the refrigerator after cleaning it, which is what we're about to do, um, also brings down that bitterness. So I just roll up the lettuce in somewhat of a single layer into a paper towel and then that goes into a baggie and then right into the fridge. Now the thing that I wanted to do with my cherry tomatoes from the large red cherry tomato plant is I needed to make more sun-dried tomatoes. I made sun-dried tomatoes about, I think it was like two to three years ago from a plant that I had a really good cherry tomato harvest from. Um, cherry tomatoes are like one of the best tomatoes to do sun-dried tomatoes with just because they're easy to cut. They have a lot of really good flavor that holds on after dehydrating and they're just really like the perfect size. So I sliced these since these were a little bit larger than a regular cherry tomato and I put them on my dehydrator trays. I dehydrate tomatoes at a very low temperature. I think I did these at 100 to 105 degrees for 24 hours. Technically, these are not sun-dried tomatoes because sun-dried tomatoes actually dry in the sun. But here in Florida, where we just got too much humidity, they would probably just mold rather than actually dry. So I dehydrate mine. You don't have to dehydrate yours for the full 24 hours. If you'll notice here, mine are more like chips. They're kind of uh, crispy and hard. You could dehydrate them for less time to make sure that you have a softer sun-dried tomato and then you can put those in oil in your refrigerator and they'll last for, I don't know, a couple months or so. They last quite a bit of time and you can also put them in the freezer to make them last longer. But I want mine to last that full two years like my last one did. So my goal was to get as much liquid or water out of these tomatoes as possible because they will hold the longest that way. So that does mean that my tomatoes are more crisp rather than that chewy texture that you get from sun-dried tomatoes that can easily be resolved by adding them to uh, a liquid of a dish. Like if you're going to use them in a pasta sauce, just put them in the pasta um, sauce and then it will reabsorb or like I use these a lot on top of salads, so I will let them soak in the salad dressing for a couple of minutes and it softens them up. I go the extra step with my sun-dried tomatoes of vacuum sealing them because vacuum sealing them will help them keep longer. It gets all that air and oxygen out. Air, oxygen, and moisture are the top things that is gonna cause a problem and keep things from storing as long as possible. You can keep these at room temperature. I like to keep them in the fridge because like I said, I want to keep them for a long, long time, years. I hope you guys had fun hanging out with me today. We harvested a lot of things, a lot of surprising things in the garden, especially in the middle of winter. But that is the amazing thing about growing food in Florida. We have a full year to grow anything that we want all year long. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure to head down and do that now so that you don't miss any future videos. Happy gardening, guys.